Hi, I'm Tom Brookshire. And I'm Pat Summerall. This week on our show, we got quite a bit of excitement going for you as there were some upsets and some near upsets last week, Tom. And Pat, it's almost playoff time and about half the teams are still in it. And I guess all depends on the last two weeks of play. Well, there's some big games in the AFC West. Uh, oh, yeah. It usually comes down to the last week between Kansas City and Oakland. But this year, those improved Denver Broncos have thrown a wrench into the works and they could still win it all by themselves. That's right. If Denver, of course, beats Oakland on the last week and San Diego, of course, this uh, Sunday, they could win the division and no matter what the other teams do. Now, San Diego's in two of those games. They also play Kansas City. The Chargers might decide that after. Well, they could, and wouldn't that be ironic if they did? Would. Over in the NFC, the Rams clinched last week, and for the first time in three years, the 49ers are out of it. Well, they've had a quarterbacking problem. It looks like Spurrier is the man of the hour, though, right now. They may be tough uh, later on in the year, too. Yeah, I guess he looked good last week. Despite the fact that those 49ers are out of the postseason games this year, they did come up with a good game against the Eagles last week. And, Tom, what about our featured performer of the week? Our featured performer of the week out west is Kenny Willard, a running back from the other side of the great beyond. Quite a comeback. Willard had been very discouraged earlier in this year and last year, as a matter of fact, because he hadn't been playing as much as he thought he should. Last week was sort of a vindication. At one time, he was going to hang it up this year to become a plumber. And somebody said he felt his career was going down the drain. But last week, he got 117 yards and 15 carries was a 16-letter man in high school and a great running back, as Pat said, against the Eagles on Sunday afternoon. Ken Willard, not the fastest guy in the league by any means, but certainly one of the toughest. When the Colts and Jets met last September 23rd, Joe Namath got himself eight weeks of rehabilitation, and the Jets all but forfeited their season. Last Sunday, with the Colts visiting Shea Stadium, the Jets and Joe Willie were set for revenge. One of the many victims of that vengeance was Colt quarterback Marty Domries, who fell four times to the reckless avalanche of green. But it wasn't just the front four that got their licks in, as seen when safety Burgess Owens struck Raymond Chester hard enough to cough up the ball. Number 27, Phil Wise, scooped up the fumble and hightailed it 80 yards for the score. But if anyone had a vendetta going last Sunday, Joe Willie was the man, and with 15 of his 21 passes right on, he wasn't to be denied. Just before the half, the defense poured through again, and this time number 84, defensive end Mark Lomas, caused a Colt turnover. And with the Jets set to take off from his own 40, Coach Howard Snellenberger was rapidly approaching the boiling point. After checking off all five receivers, Joe picked Jerome Barkham on the Colt 27. Two plays later, Namath fired a shot to Emerson Boozer, who always is a hungry man near the goal. With the score Jets 17, Colts nothing, halftime at Shea Stadium was a joyous boogaloo. But late in the third quarter, the Colts on the heels of number 35, Glenn Doughty, started to reverse that score. Five plays later, George Hunt's field goal started the Colt comeback. Following a Joe Namath engineered field goal, Domrace countered with a big gainer to Tom Mitchell. 
But the big hitter was this flea flicker from Tom Rays to former Texas star Cotton Spire, who quickly connected with wide open receiver Glenn Doughty for the score. With the Colts closing at 20 to 10, Joe Namath, with all the time in the world, momentarily lost his head. Linebacker Ted Hendricks pulled it in, and five plays later, the score was narrowed to 20 to 17. On the next series, the Jets stalled out, and the Colts took over with a lob to Spire, who broke three tackles to get into sure field goal range. But an inexcusable holding penalty pushed the kids from Baltimore back to the 40. And with a minute 52 remaining, George Hunt's reaction says it all. The 20 to 17 decision dropped the Colts to a dismal two and 10 record, which was just fine by the sweetly vindicated Jets. Well, correct me if I'm wrong, Pat, but sporting a 2-8-1 record, the San Diego Chargers met the New England Patriots last Sunday, and facing a team with a record like that, it would seem like gold from the Golden State for the New Englanders, who have now hopes for a 500 season. Well, you're right again, Tom, but since New England hadn't won against San Diego since 1966, they weren't about to spend that gold until they ground the Chargers to dust. Each week, the Chargers get closer to perfecting the old Clark to Garrett to Holiday and back to Clark, who throws to Garrison for the score play. And last week, it worked beautifully, with just one exception. In spite of all their razzmatazz, it was obvious that what the Chargers needed most was less flash and more fundamentals. But once again, a stiff rush and a San Diego bounce got the Chargers out in front first. Number 57, John Rich, picked the ball up and ran 51 yards for the score. On the next series, Jimmy Plunkett learned even more about exasperation as John Tarver turned the ball over once again. It took 10 plays to go 34 yards, but from the one, Robert Holmes rolled up a convincing six points. With a 14-3 advantage, the Chargers kicked off and apparently were expecting more breaks, but not the kind diminutive Mac Heron had in mind. For the most part, Mac's closest pursuers were shadows and his 92-yarder last Sunday gave him a club record of 823 yards returned this year, a feat most deserving of a munchkin-like spike. Trailing 14 to 10 just before the half, Jim Plunkett started to produce. First, it was a quick flip to tight end Bob Adams, who listened close enough not to hear the whistle. Six plays later, Plunkett pitched a perfect strike to Randy Vataha for the lead. By the fourth quarter, Plunkett had scored once himself and was still pushing for more. Darrell Stingley pulled down this pass to put the Patriots in position on the Charger three. And once again, the hard-nosed Plunkett found his way into the San Diego goal to round out a 30-14 conquest of the Chargers and to construct a record three-game win streak for the increasingly respectable New England Patriots. Hoping to stay alive for the wild card spot in the AFC, the Buffalo Bills came up with a super effort last Sunday as they faced the head-on challenge from those red-hot Atlanta Falcons. While some coaches attempt to build their offense around a young quarterback, Lou Saban, the head coach of the Buffalo Bills, chose instead to rally his troops around one of the game's greatest runners, number 32, O.J. Simpson. Thus far, his strategy has proven sound as the Bills are enjoying their best season in several years. And against Atlanta, the juice again at the Buffalo offense in high gear.
Simpson rushed for 137 yards for the afternoon on 24 carries, controlling the ball and leading the Bills goalward. O.J.'s running mate, Jim Braxton, added 80 yards while ripping up the middle for Buffalo's two touchdowns. The Falcons got a break when number 87, Claude Humphrey, intercepted a Joe Ferguson screen pass deep down in Buffalo territory. But the most the Falcons could produce was a three-pointer, and the frustration had just begun as a Bob Lee to Jim Mitchell spectacular brought the Falcons down close again. One play later, they failed on fourth and one, and the Bills' defense had held. In the fourth quarter, Lee found Thomas Jardine for 46 yards, and once again, they were threatening. In an isolated replay, watch Jaredine, the first-year wide receiver, evade double coverage with an incredible move inside, then turning it up for the catch. Had the ball been thrown on target, Jaredine might have taken it all the way. But when a fumble halted the drive several plays later, Bob Lee could never get the birds rolling again as they fell 17 to six to the Buffalo Bills. Well, Tom, I guess you know that out in the Bay Area, the Oakland Raider organization likes to call themselves the men of pride and poise. That's true, that's true. But when they visited the Houston area last week, the old silver and black looked more like frick and frack. In the Astrodome in Houston, the Pride and Poise boys from Oakland were supposed to enjoy a cakewalk with the Houston Oilers, while their mortal divisional enemies, the Kansas City Chiefs and the Denver Broncos, were entertaining much tougher customers. But for most of this football game, the Pride and Poise boys looked more like Manny, Moe, and Jack trying to work out a Marx Brothers routine. The Raiders gave away the football four times as Kenny Stabler threw three interceptions, including this one, to number 58, Paul Guidry, and at halftime, Oakland left the field trailing Houston 3 0. Indeed, when the Oakland Raiders did manage to look like some semblance of pro football's dynamic organization, they managed to do some very un Oakland Raider like things to destroy the image. Still, the Raiders are a strong football team with many good players like Marv Hubbard, number 44. And because of this wealth of talent, they managed to control this game even though they played poorly. But the Houston defense gave a very creditable performance. And for most of the game, whenever the Raiders threatened to roll, the Oilers defense, led by number 65, Elvin Bethay, threw Kenny Stabler on the skids. At length in the fourth quarter, Snake Stabler connected with Fred Bolitnikoff for this 21-yard touchdown, making the score Raiders 10, Oilers 3. But Houston came right back and made it 10 to 6. And on their next possession, this screen up the middle from Dante Pastorini to number 40, Lewis Jolly, put them in position to retake the lead. But with first and goal at the two, Lewis Jolly fumbled away Houston's chance for a most rewarding upset. Phil Villapiano picked the ball out of the air and raced it 52 yards upfield. Villapiano's run set up a subsequent two-yard touchdown dash by Marv Hubbard, and the Raiders escaped misfortune in this comedy of errors, coming away with a 17-6 victory. 
It was a sloppy game filled with inexplicable happenings like this 72-yard punt by Ray Guy, which Jeff Severson failed to catch near his own 30-yard line. He certainly didn't lose the ball in the sun. Maybe he just wanted to see which way it would bounce, but with the Houston Oilers, he should have known. But even more unusual was the way the Raiders treated the football, like it was some strange object all day long. The divisional races are really winding up tight this year, and last week the Cleveland Browns and the Kansas City Chiefs squared off in a game neither could afford to lose. And as we'll see, neither of them did. The Cleveland Browns have not been impressive all year long. All they do is win. No one is quite sure how. It's as difficult to single out their strengths as it is to identify any weaknesses. Not so with the Kansas City Chiefs. Their strength is their defense. It is what has held them together all season. And it was this bone-crushing defensive strength which gave the Chiefs the early advantage in their meeting with the Browns last week. A blitzing hit from linebacker Jim Lynch and a recovery by Curly Culp put the Chiefs on the warpath late in the first quarter. Then Willie Allison picked a hole over his own left tackle and blazed a trail to the Browns 16. The Chiefs quarterback Mike Livingston then found Elmo Wright slanting for the post and Kansas City had a 7-0 advantage. Elmo celebrated with his famous original Opre war dance before making whoopee with Otis Taylor and then collapsing in ritual bliss. And if that sounds silly, who ever heard of an Indian chief named Otis? When Mike Livingston was forced from the game with an injury, he was replaced by Pete Bethard, and Bethard moved the Chiefs well enough to build a 13-6 edge on the scoreboard. And the way the Kansas City defense was treating Mike Phipps and the Browns, it appeared that the Chiefs' seven-point advantage would be sufficient to settle this affair with the Brownie White Eyes. But in the fourth quarter from his own end zone, the Browns punter, Don Cockroft, outkicked his coverage. Ed Podolak fielded the ball, made the corner, and returned it 56 yards to set up his own two-yard touchdown run, giving Kansas City a 20-6 advantage. And this game seemed locked in Hank Stram's strong box. But the Browns had saved their fireworks for the last six minutes of the game. First, Greg Pruitt exploded over right guard for 65 yards, and the score was 20-13. Then from midfield, Mike Phipps found Milt Morin at the Kansas City 25, and Morin found the end zone from there, tying the game at 20 all. Pat, check this out. Isn't it surprising the heights to which a team can rise when they're struggling to remain in the playoff picture? Yes, sir, Tom, and isn't it amazing how muddled that enthusiasm can get for a team that has reached that playoff goal over a month ago? The marked contrast between the two clubs last Sunday wasn't difficult to discern. The Vikings were lighter than air. And the grim-faced Bengals were prepared to fight for their playoff lives. Even Bud Grant had a certain swagger of overconfidence about him. Meanwhile, Paul Brown couldn't have been more intense and it all added up to a Cincinnati victory of record proportions. So emphatically did the Bengals bust the Vikings that for the first time in 162 games, the Minnesota machine did not register a single point. The Bengals' defense held the Vikes to 81 yards rushing, and they did it with a thing called emotional frenzy. It got so bad, Minnesota let Bob Barry come in and direct the Viking attack. But ball-hawking linebacker number 66 Bill Berge intercepted and returned 39 yards to set up a horse Mulman field goal. 
There were big hits all day as the Bengal defense intimidated the Viking offense. Ed Marinero coughed up the ball, and number 20, Lamar Perry, scooted in with it for six. But as effective as the defense was, so too did the Bengal offense rise to the occasion as Ken Anderson and company rolled up 321 yards of total offense. Taking fast advantage of a Bill Berge fumble recovery, Essex Johnson burned the Vikes on a 40-yard draw. And while Essex Johnson was slashing and twisting for yardage, behemothly proportioned Booby Clark was steamrolling as usual. Clark's 26-yard burst set up the last Cincinnati score in which quarterback Ken Anderson found tight end Bob Trumpy all alone in the Viking goal. A repeat of the play reveals the excellent protection afforded Anderson by his offensive line and the solitary figure of Bob Trumpy in the corner of the unattended Viking goal. For the Purple Gang, the humiliating 27-0 defeat raises the inevitable question concerning their true championship medal. And for the triumphant Bengals, the victory catapults them into the heat of a three-way tie for the AFC Central Division. We'll be right back with the second half of This Week in Pro Football following station identification. After a horrid start that sapped their title ambitions, the 49ers have put together two wins in a row, Pat. That's right, Tom, and the revolving door at quarterback has now come full circle. First came Steve Spurrier, then came John Brody, and last came Joe Reed. Against the Philadelphia Eagles, Steve Spurrier was back at the helm of the Big Red Wave. The pregame show looked like one for the Guinness Book of Records. But once the hoops were traded in for helmets, the 49ers found themselves deep in trouble as the fired-up Eagles almost trapped Steve Spurrier for a safety. It seemed assured the Eagles would receive favorable field position, but as Bill Bradley navigated upfield, he fumbled, and Winlan Hall raced 66 yards for a touchdown. The startling turnabout pumped up the 49ers and the big red wave broke over Eagle setback Tom Sullivan. Forgotten warhorse Ken Willard rekindled the old flame and rushed for over 100 yards. Another forgotten man has been splendid Gene Washington, but against the Eagles he turned it up like the game breaker of old. Behind freight train guard Woody Peoples, number 69, Doug Cunningham spurted to a 21-0 49er lead. The margin ballooned to four touchdowns when Spurrier hooked up with Washington at the flag. Trailing 28-0, the Eagles rallied on a Roman Gabriel touchdown pass to the splendid splinter that are known as Harold Carmichael, the NFL's leading receiver. Then behind number 36, Norm Bulash's block, Tom Sullivan turned the corner on a picture sweep.
Gabriel found Rookie of the Year candidate Charlie Young. And the big tight end just treated the big red wave like a big red welcome mat and then treated the Eagles to a touchdown. On Young's touchdown, the victor's spoils were returned to the vanquished. But leading 31-21, the 49ers returned Young's act in kind when David Atkins, number 28, splattered over the Eagles like a pie in the face. Quarterback keeper Spurrier bolted down victory for San Francisco as the 49ers won their second straight 38 28. Out at Soldier Field in Chicago, the Los Angeles Rams wrapped up a playoff spot after a three year absence from the postseason picture, Tom. Indeed, they did, Pat. The last time the Rams were in the playoffs, they represented the old Coastal Division back in 1969. This year, though, they could even better that mark of 11 and 3. The Chicago Bears have been flying very low this year, and last week against the Rams, they bailed out. Only once all day did the Bears cross midfield, and on that sortie, George Farmer fumbled right into the hands of Rams safety Dave Elmendorf. On offense, the Rams displayed number 30, Lawrence McCutcheon, once again. His bursts through and around the Chicago defense were not long, dazzling runs, but they added up to 152 long, dazzling yards and helped to break the Rams' team rushing record of 2,475 yards for a season. McCutcheon also helped set up Jim Bertelson's three-yard scamper to a 10-zip L.A. lead. About the only thing the Bears had going for them was their magical disappearing dugout. It made Jack Snow disappear, but he came out uninjured. The deciding factor, as it has been so often this year, was the Great Ram front line, which put the Bears' attack into hibernation by allowing them only 97 yards in total offense. Number 36, linebacker Ken Geddes, was most prominent in the Chicago backfield as he demolished plays at will and came at starter Gary Huff like a buzzsaw. When Les Josephson sewed up the 26 to nothing victory on his nine-yard charge, the Rams had sewed up the NFC Western title for 1973. So for the exuberant Rams, it's on to the playoffs after the small matter of finishing the season with the Giants and the Browns. And for first-year head coach Chuck Knox, there have to be many accolades in store, for he's turned the Rams into a tough, disciplined, exciting contingent. And perhaps for all this, he should be turned into the NFC's Coach of the Year. Well, two on-again, off-again teams met up in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And while neither the Green Bay Packers nor the New Orleans Saints showed much in the way of offense, the Packer defense proved offensive enough to the Saints. In Milwaukee, the disappointing Packers were playing host to the sometimes hot Saints. But with Jerry Taggy starting at quarterback, the Pack wasn't going to disappoint anybody. Three times, Taggy brought Green Bay to successful field goal range.
Meanwhile, the Green Bay defense supplied the squeeze to Archie Manning. The pressure finally paid a dividend when Al Matthews, number 29, intercepted and darted unimpeded 58 yards for six. A repeat of the play shows that the ball was deflected off the hands of St. running back Joe Prophet, number 23, before Matthews snatched it out of the air and headed for a victory dance in the end zone. New Orleans' only touchdown of the afternoon came on an Archie Manning hookup with number 86, Jubilee Dunbar, who displayed his stop and spike technique. With the Saints closing at 13-10, Jerry Taggy took the option into his own hands and rambled 41 yards to put the Packers ahead 20-10. A repeat of the play shows that although Taggy is not Impala-like in his swiftness, he did manage to wind his way in for six with little in the way of opposition. But despite Jerry Taggy's offensive flare-up, the day belonged to the Packer defense, and they finished it fittingly on Jim Carter's interception and 42-yard return to make the final score, Green Bay 30, New Orleans 10. Well, Pat, the reviews are all in and the critics are unanimous in their opinions about the Detroit Lions. Right, Tom, with their fans howling, their owner Bill Ford bellowing, and finally their coach, the easy rider, Don McCafferty, blasting them after their Thanksgiving Day debacle against the Redskins, the Lions seem to have finally received the message. Burned by adverse criticism and with their pride at stake, the Lions vented their frustrations against the St. Louis Cardinals on the opening kickoff. Like a swarm of hornets, the Lions buzzed into quarterback Jim Hart's pocket. They clawed at him, swung at him, and finally they caught up and stung him. While their defense raged, Detroit's offense sputtered when wide receiver Jim O'Brien muffed a sure six-pointer. lost their early momentum and the Cardinals Jackie Smith swooped into the vacuum of their zone and launched St. Louis goalward. The Big Red built a 7-3 lead when whipping back Terry Metcalf burned past Lim Barney for a touchdown. But today, the game and the breaks bounced Detroit's way. On a kickoff return, Dick Geron fumbled right into the hands of teammate Jim Teal, who high-stepped through the sunspot. Quarterback Bill Munson stepped up into the pocket and hoisted a rainbow to Earl McCullough.
From the one, Steve Owens benefited from the excellent cross blocking of guard Guy Dennis, number 60, and tight end John Hilton, number 81, and he scored. With the game a dead even tie at 13 after three quarters, the Lions rode to victory on the heels of tight end Charlie Sanders. First, Sanders turned a routine look in into a 54-yard explosion. Then, after Munson averted Cardinal pressure, Sanders found a seam in the end zone for a touchdown. Trailing 20 to 16, the Cardinals saw their final hopes flicker off the fingertips of Jackie Smith. Now it was St. Louis who stewed in their own juices as Detroit silenced their critics for at least one week and won 20 to 16. Knowing that letdowns are out of the question if you're to remain in the playoff spotlight, the Dallas Cowboys travel to where the air is rare to determine if those mind over matter guys of the Denver Broncos would mind not mattering quite as much in the playoff picture. The hills were alive with the sound of playoff hopes, and for the Broncos, it was a first for this late into the season. But posing a threat to postseason play for Denver were the Dallas Cowboys, who would need to stay on the wild and bucking Broncos for more than eight seconds in order to continue their playoff habit. But the Dallas running attack was all but silenced as the Broncos yielded a mere 74 yards. Though Dallas had success with the pass, Roger Staubach unfortunately paid for every bit of it. Staubach was dropped five times by the fired up Denver defense, which featured hard knocks all afternoon. But unfortunately for Denver, a field goal and short pass from Charlie Johnson to Riley Odoms was the extent of their scoring punch. The Dallas defense kept the Broncos in check most of the afternoon, forcing mistakes which cost dearly in field position. Even Floyd Little could manage but 15 yards on nine carries, as the Stallion never escaped the Cowboy Lasso. Staubach got a super catch from tight end Gene Fuga to open the Dallas scoring. Using the play action fake to offset the fearsome Denver pass rush, Staubach hit on 14 of 18 passes for an impressive 240 yards. For the final touchdown, the gutty signal caller sent the flow right, then hit Fugit going against the grain for six. The scoring inning with number 31, Benny Barnes, dropped Bronco punter Billy Van Heusen for a safety and a 22 to 10 win. Dallas must now face the Washington Redskins for the division championship this Sunday. On Sunday, the New York Giants resembled the team that swept all its preseason games and opened as a championship contender. That's true, Pat. Of course, when the season started, the Giants bottomed out. But last week in RFK Stadium, it was a tough New York team that almost ruined the Super Bowl visions of George Allen's Redskins. 
It's been stated over and over this year that the New York Giants have been having their problems, but when it comes down to warm-up miscues, then it's time for big changes. And a big difference was noted in the Giants' offense last week as it came out really attacking for a change. Ron Johnson, number 30, powered the red and blue to the first score of the day, and that was just the beginning because before the Redskins knew it, the New Yorkers were on the way again. Randy Johnson to tight end Bob Tucker, number 38, increased the New York lead, and there was a big upset brewing in D.C. Ron Johnson continued as a one-man game buster on this 25-yard catch and carry that increased upset chances by 21-3. But the Washington team is experienced, hard to rattle, and just plain good. Billy Kilmer's pass to Charlie Taylor brought them to within range. Larry Brown finished the drive to make the score 21-10. The Redskins were on the warpath, and while the defense gathered scalps, the offense called on the cavalry. As courageous Billy Kilmer hobbled out, courageous Sonny Jurgensen trotted in. But Coach George Allen had to be worried because Sonny Jurgensen has done very little work lately due to his own injury problems. Allen must have expected him to be rusty. Sonny opened cautiously with a little flare that gallant Larry Brown turned into a big game. Then the tough Mr. Brown took it in again, and the Redskins trailed by only four at 24-20. In the fourth quarter, Sonny whistled the ball down those rusty pipes and went 11 for 11 on plays like this one to Roy Jefferson. And you've got to hand it to Sonny Jurgensen. When it comes to cool pressure passing, he has no peer. Unrelentingly, the Redskins closed and finally Jergy hit Larry Brown in the end zone to lead a great come from behind victory 27-24. It was a victory the Redskins had to have, and they got it for a fair price, a price paid by a gutty, courageous runner named Larry Brown, who perhaps more than anyone knows what it's like to play with pain, pain that will only stop for the Redskins if they can win that big one in January. Well, here's the tough part of the show, the prediction time, Pat. Uh, you've almost got me zonked. I think I'm going to make the playoffs, but uh, mm. now that I'm seven games ahead of you, you're going to have a tough time. You've got to really make a move pretty quick. There's always next year. How about St. Louis at Atlanta? There's a tough one. Well, I think, uh, as I recall, the Falcons have always had trouble against the Cardinals, mm -hmm. but uh, still the Dutchman's got to have them up. I'll go with Atlanta. I've got to go with Atlanta, too. Good pass defense, and St. Louis has to throw it. Denver at San Diego. Uh, the Denver Broncos are going to bounce back. You're not going to keep them down. I do think there'll be a few wrinkles put on them by San Diego and Ronnie Waller. Well, I'll go along with Denver, too. And okay. San Francisco at New Orleans, uh, that doesn't mean much except for the guys involved. I'm going to go for New Orleans because that's a good place to go and play a game, the Bourbon Street Super. All right, I'll differ with you. I'll take San Francisco. And how about the big game, Washington-Dallas? Who do you like there? Uh, I think Dallas at home is too tough right now for Washington, okay? At any rate, we'll be back next week to show you those games. I agree with you. I think Dallas is going to win, too. We'll show you all the action. I'm Pat Summerall. I'm Tom Brookshire, and we'll see you next week.
Brought to you by West Clocks, a division of General Time, a tally industries company. Promotional consideration provided by Best Western Motels. There are over 1,250 Best Western Motels located in more than 900 cities throughout the United States, Canada, and Mexico. And by American Airlines. If the sun is shining there, chances are American flies there. From the Caribbean to California to the South Pacific, American Airlines to the good life. Program materials for this week in pro football travel via REA Air Express.